All right, welcome to AQA 2019 paper two. As per usual, AQA will copy strike anyone who shows their papers on screen, so sorry about that. 1.1, okay, so we have this cylinder with gas in, so we have the total mass first. Now, I'm going to say M total. You don't really want to write down M equals 0 0.05 kilograms in this situation because M in these situations is reserved for the mass of one molecule. So you don't want to write it down and go, oh, I know what I'm talking about because it will inevitably lead to some confusion or mistakes later on. Okay, so temperature is 70 Kelvin. So we don't need to convert that, it's already Kelvin. We have a power of 12 watts. Don't forget that that's 12 joules per second. That might be useful just to think about it in those terms later on. And we have the pressure, or oh, we've got P and P now, just going to write power here. And the pressure stays at 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Uh, we're given a time of 890 seconds, and we're being asked to find the SHC. <laughs> and we're given the SLH, and we're given the boiling point as well. Lots of data here. So let's figure out what's going on first. We know that the total energy going in is used to raise the temperature and change the state of the gas. So in other words, MC delta T or delta theta plus ML. Okay, so we're not dealing with individual molecules in this situation, so we can drop the total here. We might have to bear that in mind for later on though. And what is the total energy going in? Well, it's gonna be the power times the time. So I'll tell you what, let's do this one step at a time, shall we? So we have 12 watts times 890 seconds is equal to mc delta t, we'll leave that there for now, plus ml, so 0 0.05 times that 2 times 7 to the 5. You can, of course, do this all in one go if you want. That just gives us 10,000. Therefore, taking the 10,000 away from the other side, we end up with mc delta t is equal to 680 joules. So all we then have to do is divide the whole thing by m delta t. So in other words, 680 divided by 0 0.05 times what's the difference in temperature is going from 70 to 77 Kelvin. And that gives us 1,943. But seeing that our data was given to a minimum of two sig figs, we're going to say that's 1,900. And the unit of that is joules per kilogram per Kelvin. 1.2, we're talking about the work done by the nitrogen when expanding and the energy required to change the state from a liquid into a gas. Let's deal with Y first because that's way easier. So it's just going to be our ML, which is what we had earlier. And of course we calculated that just now, didn't we? We found that that was 10,000 joules or one times 10 to the four joules. Okay, now let's go with work in expanding. Now work done to expand. First thing you write down is P delta V. That's always true. We already know that pressure, so that's fine. But now we need to find the change in volume. It's just going to be the final volume take away the initial volume. Or we could say that's the pressure times the volume when it's a gas, take away the volume when it's a liquid. So what is the volume when it's a gas? Now we don't have volume, but we do have densities, and we know density is equal to mass divided by volume. Therefore, swapping these round, volume is equal to mass divided by density. So therefore, the volume when it's a gas is that 0 0.05 divided by, what's the density when it's a gas? 3.8, and it gives us 0 0.013 meters cubed. What about the volume when it's a liquid? 0 0.05 divided by 810 it can be a very small number. 6.2 times 10 to the minus five meters cubed. So actually fairly negligible, but let's put it in anyway. So pressure is one times 10 to the five pascals times that 0 0.013. Take away 6.2 times 10 to the minus five. I don't think that's gonna make a difference. And that gives us 1,290 for joules. So we have our energy needed to change state and we have our work done. It takes a lot more energy to change the state of something as opposed to just the work done in expanding a gas. Not the biggest of price. 2.1, what is internal energy of a gas? I mean, it could be internal energy of anything really. I don't know why they have to specify gas, but this should be ready to go, locked and loaded. It is the sum of kinetic energy plus potential energy of all particles in a gas but it goes for any substance. 2.2, absolute zero, what does it mean? Both ways. Well, with the ideal gas laws, we know PV equals NRT or NKT. Therefore, when T equals zero, PV equals zero. And we can say P equals zero 
volume equals zero. Kinetic theory, well, we know that kinetic energy of a particle is equal to three halves kT. Therefore, when T equals zero, EK equals zero. So yeah, what a weird question. 2.3, we now have a mixture of argon and helium atoms. We have a temperature of 310 Kelvin. We have been asked to find the CRMS, root mean square speed. We have the molar mass of argon, that is 0 0.04 kilograms per mole. So we saw this equation earlier, EK is 3 halves KT for a molecule. But we also know that kinetic energy is half MV squared, or let's say C squared or CRMS squared, I'm just dropping the RMS. And that's equal to 3 halves KT. Getting rid of some halves, you can now see that, well, let's take the mass over the other side as well. There we go. And then we just need to square root that. Now, just a reminder, talked about it earlier, it wasn't necessary there, but it is necessary here to talk about it. This is the mass of one molecule. Therefore, we can't just put this 0.04 in there. We need to find the mass of one molecule, so therefore we're gonna take the mass of one mole, 0.04 kilograms per mole, and we're gonna divide that by the number of molecules in a mole. So in other words, divide by Avogadro's. One of those times when units are your friends, I say one of those times, units are always your friend. I'm gonna say that 6.64 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. So popping in all the numbers, three times Boltzmann times the temperature. Should we tidy up some powers of 10? I think so. So minus 26 on the bottom. So add 26 to the top. So actually we can just call this plus three. So in other words, three times 1,380 times 310 divided by 6.64. Then again, square root that. And we end up with a root mean square speed of 439.76 rather. 439.6 meters per second. So we're going to round that to 440 meters per second. 2.4, compare the kinetic energies of the argon and helium atoms. I just realized I've been talking about molecules in the last question. Of course, I meant atoms, but it doesn't really matter. It's the same physics. Of course, we just saw the equation EK is equal to three halves KT. So kinetic energy of particles is only dependent on the temperature. Therefore, they have same EK. And of course, they all gonna have varying EK, blah, blah, blah. So we're gonna say on average. Why is pressure exerted? Well, it's all to do with collisions, isn't it? So we know atoms collide with the piston, they change direction, and therefore momentum. As force is equal to rate of change of momentum over time, MV or P doesn't matter, they exert force on piston. So whenever it comes to kinetic theory questions about pressure and stuff like that, it's all to do with this change in momentum of the particles. Mixture stays the same. What could you do to reduce the pressure? What could you do to reduce the pressure? Well, our equation is PV equals nRT. Pressure is staying the same. We're going to assume that the volume is staying the same. So therefore, we can remove some gas. So that means that N is going down. And we could also reduce the temperature. Uh, we're being asked to explain it. Okay, fine. So remove some gas, fewer particles, fewer atoms colliding with the piston. I don't like doing W slash. I don't like it when other people do it, so I won't do it either. And reduce temperature. CRMS is smaller. Therefore, as is change in momentum and force, of course. Martin says you could increase the volume. Okay, fine. I thought we were assuming that nothing about the piston would be changing, but I guess they haven't said that. So there we go. If we increase the volume as well, of course, that means, of course, that means that there's fewer atoms per square meter hitting the piston surface. Therefore, the pressure is reduced as well. 3.1, define gravitational potential. Again, this is just one that you need to know. The energy or work required to move unit mass. Okay, you could say one kilogram, but much better way of saying unit mass because it works regardless of the unit then. And lots of people get this the wrong way around as well. It's from infinity to that point, not the other way around. Yes, we know energy is required to move a mass from a point to infinity, and that's why all potentials are negative. It's opposite day when it comes to the definition of potential. So how do the equipotentials show that the field is not uniform? A nice obvious one, equipotentials are curved. 
But if we wanted to go for a slightly better one, we can see that there is 0 0.3 joules per kilogram difference between each, but not same distance. Therefore, we can say delta V over delta R is not constant. Therefore, gravitational field strength is not constant because that's what field strength is. It can also be called the potential gradient. 3.3 calculates the escape velocity. As soon as you see escape velocity, you think energy. So we can say that Ke is equal to GPE. And incidentally, it's the same for distance of closest approach as well. So we can say that half mv squared is equal to, it's not mgh, is it? Because of course, we're dealing with big boy gravitational fields where g is changing. So therefore, we're going with gmm over r squared. One of the masses cancels. So we're going with gmm over r. One of the masses cancels. Okay, so we're looking for v. We know what g is. We're given the radius of the moon as well. But we need to find out the mass of the moon. So let's do that. And we can use, of course, one of the potentials. They said use the graph. So we know that v is equal to gm over r. Therefore, rearranging, we find the mass of the object in the middle. The mass of the moon, in this case, is equal to vr over g. So let's pick a potential. Might as well go for the first one. So 2.2 times 10 to the 6 times the distance, that's 2.23 times 10 to the 6, followed up by gravitational constant 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And so that gives us a mass of 7.36 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. Okay, now finally we can pop this back into here. We're looking for the speed, so therefore, well, let's just write it out again. Half V squared is equal to GM over R. Therefore, V is going to be equal to the square root of 2 GM over R, which looks very familiar, does it not? So popping that all in, we're given the radius of the moon as well. And that gives us 2,370 meters per second, or in other words, to two sig figs, 2,000. 400 meters per second. Not the easiest one. Okay, so we have these spheres. They have a radius of 0 0.02 meters. They have a mass of 3.2 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. And we have the distance between them as well as 0 0.04 meters. I'm not happy with that three. Nor that one. There we go. All right, so the capacitance of each sphere is that which again should look familiar we also have a charge of 52 nano coulombs so 52 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs okay gosh this looks complicated okay so we're looking for potential so we've been given charge we've been given capacitance we have an equation for all this even though this isn't a question about capacitors we can still use the equation q is equal to vc or in other words, V is equal to Q divided by C. So we can take our charge of 52 nanocoulombs and divide that by the capacitance. And we've been given this equation. So 4 pi times permittivity of free space. It's in your formula sheet. Times the radius. And so that's the 0 0.02. And that gives us 23,379 volts. Or in other words, let's just call that 23 thousand volts 4.2 we've been asked to draw labeled arrows to show the forces on sphere b so of course we have weight pulling down we have repulsion directly sideways call that electrostatic repulsion but it's in equilibrium therefore we need three forces in order to add up to zero where's the other one of course it's in the wire isn't it and that's the tension keeping it there it's going to balance the other two it's just a solution to one problem involved in the measurement of D. Okay, so two marks, so problem then solution. So one issue is that measuring instruments such as vernier caliper or something could move the spheres easily, accidentally. We could use set squares and a ruler to avoid this. Problem as well is that instrument between spheres could change permittivity. And so it would no longer be just the primitive free space that would be in that equation. Therefore, that would change the capacitance too. What could we do then? We could use insulating material. 
e.g. plastic, to a void. And that would work because if it was metal or something, then the electrons in the metal would move and that would change the permittivity. You're getting further and further away from free space. So having plastic veneer caliper or something like that wouldn't be perfect, I don't think, but it would be good enough. Show the forces about that. So force is equal to, of course, K, Q, Q over R squared. But in this case, we have D squared, don't we? If you don't like using K and you prefer using 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, that's fine. But this is such a nifty shortcut, saves you a lot of time. They have the same charge, of course, so therefore we can just say that that is 52 times 10 to the minus 9 squared. And then divide that by the separation squared. But you might have noticed that I've made a mistake because they've been cheeky. Because we have the spheres there, they've given us that distance there, but that's only to the surfaces. We need to go from the centers. So we need to add on the radius as well. So that isn't right. Instead, it's going to be 0 0.04 plus two lots of the radius. So in other words, 0 0.04 again. And it gives us 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. Okay, student measures the angle. Student records 7 degrees. Is the measurement consistent? Okay, let's just choose one of these. And we know we said we had weight pulling down, that's mg. And repulsion there, that was our 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. Okay, so now we can draw a triangle with these. Let's top and tail them. This one's going to be a lot shorter, isn't it? So our seven degrees, of course, well, seven degrees are there. So therefore, that's seven degrees there. So right angle triangle. We don't have the hypotenuse, but we do have the opposite and the adjacent. So we're going to use tan. So that means that tan of seven degrees is equal to the opposite. That's our 3.8 times 7 to the minus 3 divided by the weight, so that's mg, what was the mass again? 3.2 times 10 to the minus 3 times g. Oh, look at that, minus 3's cancel. That's nice. So is this true? That's basically what we're being asked to find out. So actually, let's find out what the angle should be. And it gives me a theta of 6.9 degrees. So I can pretty safely say yes, that is consistent. Student says gravitational force has no significant effect on the angle. Deduce with a calculation whether this is correct. Well, gravitational force, which we saw earlier, is GMM over R squared. So let's just pop all of that in. So we can just say that that's 3.2 grams squared. Divided by the separation, again, we need to go from the center of masses. And that gives us 1.1 .1 times set of the minus 13 newtons. So we can say that is much, much smaller than the 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3. Therefore, of course, the statement is valid. All right, we have a spinning coil. We have the area, we have the flux density, and we have the angle, don't we, to the horizontal. So first things first, we're told the max flux linkage, this N phi, is that many web turns, and we know that's going to be equal to BAN. So therefore, we're being asked to calculate the number of turns in the coil. So let's just rewrite this. So BAN is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Therefore, n is going to be equal to that divided by the flux of one of them. So minus 6 on the bottom, minus 3 on top. So therefore, I think we can just say times 10 to the 3. So therefore, that's 1,500 divided by 12.5. And that is bang on 120 turns. So I know lots of people put in the cos 30 in that bit of the question, but it's nothing to do with the angle yet we're told the maximum flux linkage all we do is use ban okay we're being asked to find what the flux linkage is at this point and we have the angle of 30 degrees of course we have the max flux linkage already so we don't need to deal with the flux density or the area at all we're told what the maximum is so therefore it's just going to be a matter of using cos or sine. So we know that we have the max flux linkage when we're like that, but we turn through 30 degrees, therefore we're going to use cos. So it's gonna be 1.5 times 10 to the minus three times cos 30. If you don't know where I'm getting cos 30 from, have a look at my easy vectors trick video. And that just gives me 1.3 times 10 to the minus three web turns. 
of V returns. Okay, we have a graph of the spinning coil. We have EMF and time. Calculate the peak EMF generated. Of course, we can't use the graph for that, can we? Okay, so what equations do we have? We know that EMF is equal to ban omega sine or cos. Let's go with sine for the time being, omega t. But we know that this here is the maximum EMF, so therefore we're just using ban omega. We have a graph, we can find the time period from that. So we can say this is ban 2 pi f, or in other words, ban 2 pi over the time period. So I'm just going to rewrite that as 2 pi ban over t. So that's 2 pi. Of course, we already know what ban is. We already calculated that earlier, 1.5, or we were given it rather. Divide that by the time period, we can see is 0 0.25 seconds. So in other words, times by 4, so let's call that 8 pi. And it gives me a peak EMF of 0 0.0377 volts. What was our data to? Two sig figs, so therefore we're just going to say 0 0.038 volts. Sketch what is happening to the flux linkage. Well, let's get our EMF graph again. So EMF is doing that. Gosh, that's bad, but whatever. So don't forget that EMF is rate of change of flux, or rate of change of flux linkage. So in other words, we can say that we have a big EMF when the flux or flux linkage is changing quickly. I guess we should probably have a minus in there as well, just so we're being careful. I think they give you the mark either way though. So let's have a look. This is where we have a big EMF. So that means that the flux linkage must be changing quickly at that point. So therefore it must be going through equilibrium. We have a big gradient, but it's a minus. So we have a positive EMF. Therefore we're gonna have a negative change in flux linkage. So therefore it's going to go down like that through there. What about these points here? when the EMF is zero, that's when the flux linkage isn't changing. And so we know that that happens at the top of curves, doesn't it? So therefore we can put that there. There we go, we can see the 90 degrees out of phase. So let's carry on like that. Very similar to what we see with SHM, things being 90 degrees out of phase like there as well. Just come down like that. I kind of messed up the ending here, but whatever. There we go. 6.1, why do neutrons have to have less kinetic energy in order to be absorbed by fuel? Or we could say uranium atoms. We could say uranium nuclei. Easy start, 6.2. So a neutron loses 63% of its kinetic energy. Classically, they've given us how much is lost. So we need to know how much it keeps. So 37%, of course. So it has initial kinetic energy of that. So therefore, calculate the kinetic energy after five collisions. So all we do is take our two mega electron volts. Let's turn that into just electron volts because, well, the answer's in that anyway. And then we times that by our factor of 0 0.37, and then that's to the power of five. And that just leaves us with the two sig figs, 14,000 electron volts, or we could just say 1.4 times 10 to the four. Okay, kinetic energy goes to about one electron volt. Why does the number of collisions needed depend on the nucleon number of the moderator atoms? Okay, so we need to say first things first that collisions are elastic. So what we have are, so we have neutrons coming in and they are colliding with the nuclei and then pinging off again, but they're also transferring some momentum to the nucleus as well that it's bashing off. And you know from and you know from snooker balls that if a neutron collides with a neutron, then the first neutron will stop dead, the other one will carry on. But then if it collides into something big, then obviously that's not going to be the case. The larger the nucleus, the less kinetic energy is going to be transferred to it, and the more that neutron is going to ping back at its initial speed and initial momentum. So we can say a larger nucleus equals larger mass, of course. More nucleons results in that. Might as well be explicit. Therefore, less EK transferred to nucleus. Therefore, more collisions needed. Bit of binding energy, I love binding energy. Calculate the energy released. So let's have the total mass going in. So uranium plus just the neutron. And then we're going to take away the mass afterwards. So xenon, strontium, and then four lots of neutrons. 
of course we have one neutron on the left three on the right so we can just forget about the one on the left just change this to three over that side so this we have to be super duper careful because even just the smallest thing wrong in your calculator will mess up the whole thing so the mass on the right i think that's that and that gives us a mass defect of 0 0.1799 tell you what i think we can just go 180u we're looking for mega electron volts the conversion vector is each u is 931.5 mega electron volts that's in your formula sheet and that gives us to three sig figs 168 mega electron volts interestingly enough i think we could have gone to four sig figs because it was our conversion factor that was the lowest accuracy value okay 6.5 three benefits of nuclear power finally some good press for nuclear it is good it used to be not good but now it's awesome less pollution created if you wanted to put this less co2 produced as fossil fuels not being burned and no carbon dioxide is not a pollutant because because carbon dioxide is one of the most important gases necessary for life to exist that's like saying just because something produces oxygen it's a pollutant and it's way way better than renewable sources as well because it's a large amount of energy huge amount of energy produced by relatively very little fuel we can also say that it's a we can also say that it's a constant output unlike renewables as well mark scheme gives a couple of extra ones that i don't think are very good ones but there we go those are the three that i would go with if you wanted to you could mention sulfur dioxide in particular from burning fossil fuels which create acid rain okay multiple choice number seven brownian motion which one's true can you see the motion of air molecules mm, technically not i guess i mean I thought the whole thing was that you could sort of visualize what they're doing, but whatever. Caused by the collisions of smoke particles. No, brownie motion is just the actual air particles moving. We can see the brownie motion with smoke. It's caused by collisions between air molecules and smoke particles. Yes. Not a very good question, though, that one, to be honest. I don't dig it. Number eight, two scalar quantities. A, potential, yes. Field strength, no. So therefore, it can't be A. B, mass, yes. And potential yes so the answer has to be b nine what's the angular speed of a satellite in a geostationary orbit okay so we're looking for this omega is equal to 2 pi f or 2 pi over the time period so that's equal to 2 pi divided by well what's the time period for a satellite in geostationary orbit it's the same as the rotation of the earth so 24 hours but we need this in seconds so it's times by 3600 and it gives us 7.3 times 10 to the minus 5 rads per second. So therefore the answer has to be B. 10, planet of mass R, blah, blah, blah. Material at its equator only just remains on its surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They always love saying this. Whenever you see this planet turn so quickly that things start to levitate or float, basically the things on the surface have now become satellites. So what we do is treat it as a normal satellite and say mb squared over R is equal to gmm over r squared however we're looking for the period so we're going to go with m omega squared r instead one of the m's cancels one of the r's goes over here we know that just from the early question omega is 2 pi over t so that's squared equals gm over r cubed we're looking for t i'm going to say that's 4 pi squared over t squared gives us gm over r cubed Therefore, swapping everything over, we find that t squared is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed over gm. Okay, the answers are in terms of 2 pi, right? So we can take the 2 pi out of the square root because of the 4 pi squared. So that just gives us r cubed over gm. So the answer is c. 11 satellites n and f, same mass. Orbital radius of f is greater than n. Okay, so the radius for f is greater than the radius for n what is greater for f than n okay well maybe we were going to use kepler's law actually we know that t squared is proportional to r cubed oh and look at that we can already see it d that's our answer bigger r bigger t 12 objects move freely 90 degrees blah 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 okay so circular motion the acceleration is it's not zero opposite to the direction of the field no of course not it has to be in the same direction right so therefore it's going to be that isn't it is 90 degrees to the direction of travel, but not to the field, because of course we know that with field lines, they show the direction of force and therefore acceleration. Electron, B, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we're talking about charged particles in magnetic fields. So we're gonna use mv squared over r equals bqv. One of the v's cancels. 
and we're looking for the radius so therefore we're going to swap all of these rounds so therefore radius is equal to mv over bq so what's staying the same well they're both electrons so mass is staying the same and they must have the same charge as well so therefore we can say that r is proportional to v over b so what's happening to the second electron its speed is half but its field strength its flux density rather is times by four so therefore the whole thing is going down divide by two divide by four again so therefore it's going to be divided by eight so therefore the answer has to be a okay we have a charge in between two parallel plates what is v so it's levitating so therefore we know we have a force pulling upwards and a force pulling downwards of course it's the force due to the electric field pulling upwards and we have the weight pulling downwards therefore we can say that mg is equal to eq which is the force due to an electric field for parallel plates though we know that e is equal to v over d the voltage divided by the separation of the plates therefore mg is equal to q v over d we're just looking for v therefore just putting everything over the other side we have mgd over q so the answer is b 15 okay so we have a work done or energy of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 joules we have a charge of 30 microcoulombs and we're looking for voltage well well pd pd as you know is just work done per unit charge joules per coulomb as it were so I don't think we need a calculator for this actually. So let's sort out some powers of 10. I can just call this times 10 to the two on top now. So in other words, 0 0.5 times 10 to the two. So that is 50 volts. Electric field acts into the plane of the paper. Okay, so like that. Electron enters the field 90 degrees to the field line. So just like that. I don't think it matters though. The force on the electron. Wait, didn't we see something like this earlier? Of course it's not gonna be zero. Along a direction of the field, no, because we know field lines show the direction of force on a positive charge, so we can't be that. It's not going to be 90 degrees because it's not a magnetic field, so opposite to the direction of the field, it has to be D. Ionization potential, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, it's just energy, isn't it? So we know that the energy of an electron accelerated through a potential V is just E times V. You know, we've just seen this in question 15. Energy is charge times voltage. We know this has to be equal to half mv squared. So what is v? It has to be square root of 2 ev over m. So the answer is d. Okay, 18, small radioactive source, straight tracks about 4 centimeters, so therefore it's going to be alpha because they stop after a few centimeters. Placed next to a Geiger tube, count rays detected, but when aluminium is put in between the tube force to the background rate, so therefore it has to be beta as well. If it was gamma, then it would still be the same even with the aluminium there so therefore the answer is d parallel plate capacitor blah 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 all right what gives the greatest capacitance okay so therefore we need our equation capacitance is equal to a epsilon zero epsilon r divided by d but we're only concerned with epsilon r and d therefore we can forget about those so therefore we can say that capacitance is proportional to epsilon r divided by d so let's look at a so we have 2 divided by 0 0.4 so that gives us a relative value of 5 what about b 3 divided by 0 0.9 that gives us 3.3 .3, so it's not going to be b c we have 4 divided by 1 so that's 4 so again not that then d 6 divided by 1.6 and again that gives us a value lower than the 5 that we had for a therefore that's our answer 20, we have a capacitance of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. We have a time of 20 seconds and we have and we have a current of 10 microamps, so 1 times 10 to the minus 5 amps. We have current and time, therefore we can find out charge. So it's just going to be 20 times 10 to the minus 5, or in other words, 2 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. And we're being asked to find the energy. Energy is equal to, well, there's three equations that we can choose from, but we have charge and we have capacitance. So we're going to use half Q squared over C. So it's half times 2 times 10 to the minus 4 squared divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 6. So that's a half times, I don't think we need 
calculate if there's 4 times 10 to the minus 8 divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 6. So in other words, half times 4 times 10 to the minus 2. So that's just going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 2. So the answer is C. OK, 21, we have capacitance of that again. We have a charge and we have a resistance. And we're looking for current. Of course, we're going to have to use V equals IR. And current is going to be equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. But we need to find the voltage first. So we're going to use Q equals VC. V is equal to Q over C. So actually, why don't we just pop this all in there? Therefore, current is equal to Q over RC. So that is 15 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by the 25 times the 1 times 10 to the minus 6. Cancel powers of 10. So actually, this just ends up being 15 divided by 25. So I can already see that's going to be just less than 1. So it's going to be 0 0.6 amps. That's going to be C. OK, we have capacitor decay. What's the PD after time? T. All right, so we know that V is equal to V0 times E to the minus T over RC. But if we're looking at the time that is the same as the time constant, then this just ends up being minus 1. And anything to the power of minus 1 is the same as divided by that value. So therefore, a bit of a sneaky one, but the answer is B. We have this coil. When there is a current in a coil, okay, let's check A. There's no magnetic forces on S, P, and Q, R. That's a lie because, of course, one of them is going to go up out of the paper, the other one's going to go down. B, there are no magnetic forces acting on P, Q, and R, S. Yeah, that sounds about right because the current is going in the same direction as the field. And we know current has to cross field lines in order for there to be force on the electrons. 24, horizontal length of that. We have a weight, so in other words, a force of 1 Newton. Flux density of 1.5 Tesla. And we're looking for the current. Therefore, we're going to employ F bill. Rearranging this, current is equal to force divided by PL. So that is 1 divided by 1.5 times 0 0.5. So in other words, 1 divided by 0 0.75. So I reckon the answer's got to be 1.3. 25, what is not an assumption? A, they collide elastically with container walls. That is true. So it's not A. B, they have negligible size compared to the distance. That's also true. It's not a very good way of putting it, but it is technically true. C, they travel between the container walls in negligibly short times. That is not an assumption, therefore it's C. D, the collisions are short times. Yes, that is true, so it's not that. 26, we have two coils. When switch is closed, coil Q experiences a force. What is true? Well, we know that we only have a force when we have a change in magnetic field, and that change in magnetic field only happens when you switch on the switch. After that, the current is constant, therefore there's not going to be a change in magnetic field. Therefore, the force is not going to increase to a value. It's going to increase very rapidly and then stop. Of course, Lenz's law says that this force has to basically try and stop the thing that's making it happen from happening. Therefore, Q wants to yeet itself out of there that way. So therefore, the answer is D. 27, classic question. Well, we know that it's only when we have a complete loop can we have an eddy current inside of it. Therefore, P and R arrive at the same time because even though there is a partial coil, there's not going to be an eddy current inducing that partial coil. So therefore, P and R arrive together followed by Q. Yes, that is correct. 28, current I, P, blah, blah, blah. OK, but then we have an alternating current with resistance 2R and a peak value of I. OK, so the current in this second resistor is not going to be, or at least the average, the RMS value, is going to be that peak current divided by root 2. OK, so we're looking for the power in the second resistor. We know that P is equal to I squared R. So what's happening to I in the second resistor? Well, I is going down by root 2. But because it's squared, that means that it's just going down by 2. But then we can see that R has also doubled, so therefore they negate each other. Therefore, everything stays the same, so the answer is just going to be B. 29, we have this CRO trace. Y voltage is 10 volts, so therefore the peak voltage is 10 volts. Therefore, VRMS has to be 7 volts. It's not going to be bigger than that. Frequency, well, the time period, we're told the time base is 5 milliseconds, so therefore two squares. Time period is 10 milliseconds, in other words 0 0.01 seconds. So frequency is one divided by that, so it gives us 100 hertz. So therefore the answer has to be D. 30, 
deuterium nucleus, tritium nucleus, what is X? Well, just looking at the numbers, we know that one, one goes to two, so therefore that has to be zero, so therefore it's not going to be a proton, but the mass is, well, it has to have a mass of one in order for everything to balance out, therefore it must be a neutron. Finally, 31, what do control rods do? Average kinetic energy of fission neutrons, it's not going to change that, therefore it's not going to be B or D. Number of fission neutrons, it takes fission neutrons out of the equation, it absorbs these fission neutrons, therefore the answer is going to be C. So because it's taking these fission neutrons out of the equation, the average kinetic energy of fission neutrons still in the game is unchanged. Not a very nice way of putting it, if you ask me, but there we go. Hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like, and if you want to see other AQA papers, then click on the card, and it'll take you to the playlist. See you next time.